From the ONF Studios, I'm Robert Neal, with a special conversation with Ginger Gilmore, former wife of Pink Floyd's David Gilmore. Ginger has written her autobiography, Memoirs of the Bright Side of the Moon, in which she traces a number of adventures in her life, including, of course, her marriage to David Gilmore and her front row view of the band, which also included members Nick Mason, Roger Waters, Richard Wright, and Sid Barrett. She also talks about her growth into becoming an artist, guided by what she describes as a revelation about beauty and its importance. I spoke with Ginger from her home near London and started by asking how she first met David back in 1971. I was a um, shop owner, a boutique owner of eccentric clothing called paraphernalia. Um, I was a model. I had just gotten a lead role in a film, a bit like West Side Story and um, Easy Rider. And he came into town, the group came into town. There, it was a weekend festival every end of October, every year in Ann Arbor, Michigan, for the university. And Pink Floyd was play, was one of the bands. I'd never heard of them before. Oh, okay. But I had a, I, I loved the Moody Blues and Doors and Joni Mitchell and Neil Young and the Beatles and Leon Russell and Jethro Tull. I was definitely of the 60s in that regard, but I had never heard of um, Pink Floyd. In the book, you describe the, the concert setting in, in a really interesting way. When the mu- once the music started, you said we were transcended from what we knew as normal yep. to a world where peace and beauty united us all. Yep. They had a way of doing that. And um, that was my experience. And I know that um, one of the things I feel is an attribute with my book is that I allowed that to be there in a description, the actual experience that I know over the years people have felt. And in a lot of the books about any of the other bands and the Floyd, particularly in this instance, that part isn't really described and because I love writing and I'm an artist and I wanted people to go on a journey and to go to go on that journey that they felt at those concerts as well, to acknowledge that. Because there were times that the sheer force of the need and the popularity and the emotion of the audience, um, we had to keep it at bay a bit. And I just feel like that part, the bright side of what they created, even they missed it sometimes because they were worried about, as it got more developed as time went on, the click track and the headphones. And Mm -hmm. that that certainly was one of David's and Rick's um, vision that they kept on trying to bring into it. You know, the music, the feeling, the music, the journey, the magic of what happens when... I mean, it happens with me with my art sometimes that they it will touch the archetypal aspect of us being human and what beauty there is inside us, in life, in the flowers, in the rainbow. They, out of many groups that I ever experienced, I don't know if they're conscious of this, but they did that. In, with their audiences. It didn't necessarily happen every night, but as they developed, it certainly happened more often than not. And it's really special when when art unites people together, when humanity touches what's special about being human. That is what the true purpose of art should be. And I feel the Floyd did that. He, they were... One of the first experiences of that, and I feel very grateful. They had to stand the test of time and criticism and judgment, and they held the vision over the years under great duress at times. Let's go back to uh, 1971, when you you first encountered there. At that point, 
how popular was the band? Were they drawing big concerts? Were they buying big fans then? Where were they at? Nothing like what they have become, for sure. And it was money that switched it to large stadiums. They tended to like to be, well, they could only afford in some ways to be in the concert halls at colleges and things because, one, they liked the intimacy of it because they that music, with the sound in the round, they could control it. I really don't know how much they consciously would articulate this, but they certainly, in their bones, in their music, more and more they they wanted to take us in and travel. Um, I found out recently that um, Rick Wright was um, very interested in a composer called Stockhausen. And he, if you look him up, he was very much into the science of sound and with the audience. He had a vision that one day we would have auditoriums where we would be sitting in a certain place and the spatial aspect would affect the ability to raise consciousness from the music being played. And Rick was very much into that, but I never knew, of course, I never heard of Stockhausen then. It was been in the last few years I've discovered him and the music that he inspired and trained people to play. But Rick was into it. And it's it's a revelation for me because I can see totally what his quality was. I can't speak for the rest of the Floyd whether even if they had spoken of Stockhausen with the sound in the round, which was one of his principles, and he was in late 20s going into the 50s, I believe, but don't quote me on that. Okay. Um, so it's like they could have been inspired by that aspect. We, they were one of the few groups that used the sound in the round. Do, do me a favor. Describe the sound in the round. What, what exactly are we talking about? Well, a lot of music, like if you listen to an orchestra or you listen to another band, most, most of the sound is coming towards you. But the Floyd makes it a 360-degree experience so that you have um, speakers all around the auditorium and some of the music sounds will be taken all the way around you so that you're engulfed in into the music as opposed to just having it come at you. It's like a 3D experience uh, audially then. In some ways, but I would almost take it to a five-degree experience. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I'm curious of what you said about Rick. You obviously didn't know of his influence back then, but when you look back at the music now and the things he helped create, do you see then the elements uh, of the influence? Well, the, yes. I think they were gestalt, and I think they each had a role to play that they had. Um, they fused together. At the beginning, they were very much building that creative dynamic of a group. And each one of them had a very important part to play in that. Did you travel uh, with the group when they toured early on? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Now, what were those, what were those tours like? It can't be, it wasn't a luxury life, I'm assuming. No. It wasn't. And my mom said, oh, my God. You're with a pop group. What do you think? <laughs> she thought I was going to. Well, I was. I was not only artistic, but I was um, very, very intelligent, and I was applying to be a chemical engineer at one point. And I was very, very prolific as an artist. But in those days, the art was in the back of the um, school, and it wasn't really considered a worthy career. Really. And mm -hmm. because I was so intelligent and was really into the three R's, A's across the board and all that, and um, she couldn't believe that I suddenly, you know, went off with this rock star who wasn't necessarily my dad, who was separated <laughs> from my mom. He goes, who is this guy? <laughs> who is this Dave Gilmore? <laughs> I'm assuming they'd never heard of, uh, of the Floyd. Never. No, I mean, they probably never heard of Jimi Hendrix or The Doors or any of those. My mother loved Johnny Mathis. 
Oh, well, who doesn't, though? But Yes, I know. It's I was, a different genre, though. Yes, quite. And Harry Belafonte. I mean, that's what, and certain, you know, opera singers and stuff. And my, my dad wasn't into music when they were separated, not that I'm aware of. So, um, yeah, he's, it certainly put him to the test. I'm curious, when you were traveling yeah. during these tours, was this was this in the States? Was this uh, in England? Where were you? When I um, first met David in Ann Arbor, and we had this love at first sight connection, really quite incredible. It was like one of my major dreams suddenly hit, you know. I my One of them was to be an actress, but I um, left um, all my shops and house and lead role in a film and I had uh, called the because it had been raining the directors hadn't signed me yet uh-huh. and um, so I was calling them and saying listen you know I really have to go um, and they kept calling me through the whole night while I was packing and, and things and they finally said okay Go ahead, call us when you get to New York. So here I am, my friend Morpheus, who had introduced us. I had an, an, a male, a person I was living with, and we just had a, um, a friendship. Mm-hmm. And he wasn't around. And so Morpheus drives me to um, the airport in Detroit. And so we're going around the corner in his van, and I'm like really somber almost crying when my hair down and the van jolts to a stop and I look up and there are these two black limousines coming at us. One t- does a, a 180 and blocks the road in front of us. The other one goes over the, the sidewalk and blocks us from, the, from behind. It was like, is this a James Bond movie? <laughs> <laughs> what is happening here? And the thing, the director suddenly come out of the uh, limo. They driven up and tried and hoped to catch me, to convince me and kidnap me to take me away, knowing oh, that. Wow! I know, I know. It was like, oh, and it's all in the book. And it, it's um. So fortunately, the soft-hearted one came to my window, and I just looked at him and I shook my head like, no, no. Please let me go. And they looked. They looked at. They looked at each other and said, "Okay, just let her go." And I almost missed the flight. And I'm running down the uh, corridor to get to the gate with four suitcases. My life. Wow. Yeah. That concludes part one of our conversation with Ginger Gilmore. In the second installment, we'll talk about her romance with David that eventually led to marriage, but we'll also discuss some of the more infamous hardships involving the band.